This is an interview with Sam Obuya about how Russia's invasion of Ukraine will shape the world for decades to come. Samo is a geopolitical specialist and the founder of Bismarck Analysis, where he's paid to predict the future of international relations. I think this is an unjust war for what it's worth. I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine is unjust morally. But whether or not it's, you know, just morally, that's completely separate from the question of what is the geopolitical reality. States pursue their interests haltingly, failingly, poorly, perhaps, but they do pursue their interests. So that's what I mean with this inevitability. It's not that this particular war was inevitable, is that some sort of clarification of the situation of Ukraine was inevitable. He disagrees with a lot of the conventional wisdom of what's happening now, and he's willing to make solid predictions and potentially to be proved wrong. But I do have to emphasize there's a whole number of things that, you know, as far as I can tell is the case that I wish is not the case. So I'm in the happy, happy position where every time I'm sort of proven wrong, I'm often very happy to have been proven wrong. So I'll be absolutely delighted if, you know, Ukrainian sovereignty is preserved, if, uh, you know, both say the Putin government is replaced by more Western values aligned government and uh, the sanctions can be lifted. So the suffering of the Russian and Ukrainian people is alleviated. All of these are great outcomes. And then if I were to boil it down into three predictions, right? Three predictions. China develops more alternatives to the Western financial and economic system and starts offering them to rogue states around the world. Number two, Russia successfully occupies large chunks of Ukraine that it did not control before this invasion. Number three, Putin remains in power for the next year. I don't know what happens after. Now, as you'll see in this conversation, I don't fully agree with everything he says, but his arguments are solidly researched and they make a lot of sense and I think are a valuable contribution to the debate. It's hard to forecast these things, but you have to admit that there is a little bit of a consensus that's developed yeah. right now. And, uh, you know, I think there's little value in not being willing to disagree with the consensus, even when it's costly. So just because I disagree doesn't mean I'm right. But I think, you know, part of the, the strength of the Western system should be precisely this ability capability to disagree as individuals, as communities, etc. So Sam Obuya, welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. So Samo, you have something of a contrary position for what is kind of developing into a bit of a consensus at the moment over the, the Russia invasion of Ukraine. And I think it's important to to interrogate that. I've, I've not agreed with all of your takes, and I think we'll we'll maybe kind of disagree over some things or have different views on some of the things we're going to discuss. How are you seeing it at the moment? First off, yes, it's very important that, especially in sort of a time of unanimity, we still preserve this ability to discuss and interrogate each other's positions. Arguably, that's you know ultimately one of the strengths of sort of the Western, Western system of government, Western value system. I view the situation as unfortunately a mixture of sort of over optimism and rationalization from our military and diplomatic leaders who have unfortunately over the last 20 years made many mistakes. Now, I do not think that this is a just war, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The nuance here is that even though it is a terrible humanitarian disaster, possibly a great strategic blunder, we do not see the evidence of this being a military, strictly military disaster for Russia. Further, it is, you know, the approach of fighting tanks with sanctions has some merit, but the Chinese economic system is ready, not necessarily willing, but certainly able to pick up the pieces that the West leaves economically. So even if it doesn't offer this base of support to Russia, other countries around the world in the future will more and more want to turn to China, not the West, for their economic integration. You're an expert in geopolitics. You're the founder of Bismarck Analysis. I think one of the things that is really clear at the moment is this sense of how difficult it is to, to kind of work out exactly what's going on, because we've got the kind of classic fog of war 
but combined with an incredible amount of narrative warfare, as you'd expect, with the conflict that Russia's involved in, in and the eyes of the rest of the world are on as well. What sources do you trust? The problem is that even if we trust sources on the mere fact of the matter, it can be very difficult to trust their presentation or selection, right? So there are two separate questions. You know, who is giving you accurate information versus inaccurate information? And who is giving you biased information with what bias that information carries? It's impossible to avoid some sort of selectivity and bias here. I think it's very important to check out what's happening on the ground through open source intelligence. It's important to be informed by pictures on the ground, by video, by the counting of tanks and so on. However, if you try to reassemble a picture of the war from this bottom-up perspective, you're going to have a very hard time. Also, war is a messy business. If you imagine smartphones being present during the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, you might well conclude that America is losing. Just on the basis of the realities, the messiness of war, right? Equipment getting lost, um, people running out of supplies, uh, you know, storms, literal desert storms interfering with uh, the operation has happened uh, in Iraq. These things are, you know, they don't match well with our narrativized form of war. So this brings me to sort of the second point that I would like to make. It's not just about where you get your information from, it's where you get your models of war from, right? Just on the technical grounds of success. Say, if you were to judge the Russian military operation in Ukraine, this invasion of the country by US military doctrine, it's an unmitigated disaster because US military doctrine proposes you must first establish air supremacy. But is that the only way to wage a modern war? Soviet doctrine in the, even the 1980s disagreed, and Russian contemporary military doctrine disagrees. What they instead propose is that for a country like Russia, the key aspect is building up anti-air defenses. That, by the way, is very important. It's premised on denying air supremacy to NATO and using artillery instead to deliver firepower. Artillery is subpar, it's slower. Sometimes it's less accurate, though the Russians have used targeting drones paired up with mobile artillery to increase the precision of artillery strikes. However, you know, think about the implications of that. Okay, there's a military here that's designed to counteract NATO air supremacy. The reluctance or sort of carefully feeling out whether to try to impose a no-fly zone I don't think this is just about avoiding World War III. I think NATO is rightly concerned as to what its losses would be if it tried to use air power to stop the Russian uh, you know, land-based invasion with strong, thick anti-air defenses. Yeah, and in this conversation, I'd love to talk about what you think is going on on the ground with the progress of the war at the moment but also pull out to look at kind of the geopolitical implications and where you think things are going from a sort of broader perspective. Um, I know you've taken a slightly contrary view. So the, let, let's say that the general consensus now is that Russia's doing extremely badly, that it really looks like they expected it to be a short conflict and to be over very quickly, and the morale of their forces looks incredibly weak. Do you agree with that perspective at all, or do you think it's it's fundamentally mistaken? I think there is much to be said about the logistical trouble that the Russian military encountered. I think we currently, if we're living in the West, we have no good way of telling what the actual morale of Russian soldiers is. What would our sources be, right? It would only be Western interviews. It would only be interviews, by the way, with POWs captured by Ukraine. I mean, if you were judging the morale of, uh, say, you know, American soldiers in Vietnam, only not by the statements of the soldiers themselves, but by the statements of POWs recorded by the Viet Cong, I, I don't know. I don't think that's a reliable source of information at all. Um, the Russian public seems to be hesitant, but supportive in broad strokes of Putin. All of the 
polling that we have seems to indicate this. Now, the question of is it a disaster or not, again, has to be judged by Russian standards, not Western standards. Russian military is willing to absorb higher casualties. This has always been the case. I think that the current operation is uh, going at, let's call it a B minus. I think the Russians hoped for better, but nothing that has occurred so far has escaped Russian contingency planning. In other words, the Ukrainian defenses have, in my opinion, been much stronger than the Russians assumed. So I wouldn't even consider this an underperformance of the Russian military, rather an overperformance of the Ukrainian military, the population, and the government, which of course ultimately might make the occupation very costly. But if you were listening to people just a few days ago, right, Tuesday, uh, you know, uh, start, of, uh, start of March, you would assume that Russia's on the edge of collapsing, that Putin's hiding in a bunker and yelling at his generals, that he's about to be overthrown, and all sorts of nonsense like this uh, that I think was just propaganda from the Western side. Obviously, your your business makes predictions. You sort of stand and fall on the on the basis of those predictions. Um, I know that uh, Slate Star Codex or Codex Ten, as it is now, was said that I think it gave you a C for your for your predictions on the war. What what did you make of that? I mean, Scott said that uh, in that review that he can't actually find anything I said that was wrong. So I'm going to let that stand where it is. I'm sorry, if someone says that, uh, you know, they're giving you a C minus because they haven't found anything to disprove, I feel that means that they were just trying to prove you wrong. And I, I'm afraid I, you know, I, I like his blog, uh, but I think the pro-Russian perspective, not in the sense of it's good that Russia wins, just that, look, Russia is competent, is capable of achieving these goals, I think it's just a very hard perspective to grapple with. Note the uh, reports that that grade was based on. Um, you know, he was reading the Twitter threads, not the reports. And from the biggest frame of the kind of geopolitical shifts that we've been seeing, so there was a, a, a lot of people have been talking for an awfully long time about the the end of the liberal order, and you imagine that that kind of fed into some of Russia's thinking that the the West was weak, the West was divided. But a lot of people have remarked on that, in a way, this seems to have galvanized and reunified a sense of common purpose. Do you think that that's a fair summary, that the response from the West has actually shown there's a bit of life in the old um, dog, horse yet? Well, I think generally, you know, people underestimate how slow decline is. The Roman Empire, after it became an empire, still had several centuries of life, right? So if you are living in the Roman Republic, you might be convinced that this is on the edge of falling apart just because of the impending compounding crisis, both in the social and the uh, military aspect of things, the political chaos, right, of constant civil war. But there's a lot of ruin in a nation. And generally speaking, the Western world remains the most technologically advanced, the most prosperous, uh, even overall, the population of the United States plus Europe, it's still about 1 billion people. This is a significant power block, but I do think it is just that. It is just a power block. I think US hegemony is over. And the very fact that Russia dared to gamble on this invasion, whether or not the invasion comes to be, you know, comes to pass. That that fact, I think, uh, very much shows that Western power has weakened. Just because the bloc comes together doesn't mean those outside the bloc are coming together. Note India has not joined Western sanctions versus Russia, nor have actually most other countries around the world. Where we talk about unanimous international condemnation of Russia, we are once more speaking of the so-called international community that consists of, in the first approximation, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Western Europe, and the United States, hmm. leaving and out most of the planet, hmm. the global south, so-called. Hmm. 
Yeah, this has been a really interesting process for me looking at kind of the sense making around this topic. I was a foreign producer for many years. I know a fair bit about kind of international relations. And you look at the, everything seems very contextual. And when it comes to kind of looking at kind of the origins of the conflict, it seems very complex. There's two principal narratives. And from from my perspective, it seems that both of them have some truth, but people seem to have a tendency to want to collapse their sense-making into one or the other. On one side, you've got someone like John Mearsheimer saying that it was NATO's expansion. They didn't realize how that would be seen by Putin, that they were kind of leading Ukraine down the primrose path. And on the other side, there's the perspective that Russia's a mafia state that has been getting away with things for a long time, that the West didn't put up any resistance to many of Russia's kind of oversteps in the past from kind of poisoning people in the UK to their in interventions the war in, in Syria Georgia. and yeah in Georgia and and obviously in Ukraine in 2014 what do you think of those two narratives which do you think has the most validity or do you think that in some way we've got to assume that that it's a combination of both i think that it's very straightforward that russia is engaging in an exercise in empire building it is just imperialist in the technical sense of the term. However, what's not discussed is that imperialism itself has powerful economic and security drivers whenever it's undertaken. Uh, Russia, in fact, has severe geopolitical security problems. It is, in fact, unacceptable for Russia to have hypersonic missiles a few minutes flight from Ukraine to Moscow. And if Ukraine were to join NATO, I think we have no reason to believe no reason at all to believe Western promises that offensive weapons would not be stationed there. That in fact, our offensive weapons, yes, strategic offensive weapons, stationed in Eastern Europe, which was just a few years ago promised to never happen, promised that, you know, the Polish, the Romanians, the Hungarians, uh, Latvians, they just want to be safe from Russia. We don't, we're not going to expand our offensive weaponry against Russia. But really, any anti-missile installation is trivial to change into a, you know, installation that is just housing missiles for offensive purposes. NATO is not benevolent. Both NATO and Russia are engaged in imperialist expansion, driven, of course, by irresolvable, at least mutually irresolvable, legitimate security concerns. And I think that's the tragedy of the human condition. So could you clarify what you mean by that, that you just think that that's inevitable? You're not sort of blaming NATO for that. You're just saying this is just how things are. I think that if there's an imbalance in power, right, if there's an imbalance in power and there are security concerns related to especially nuclear weapons, but also strategic resources such as food, oil, um, basically just raw space, right? You want as much buffer as possible. States pursue their interests, haltingly, failingly, poorly, perhaps, but they do pursue their interests. So that's what I mean with this inevitability. It's not that this particular war was inevitable. It's that some sort of clarification of the situation of Ukraine was inevitable. Either there would be another coup, like the one in 2014, and the government would once more flip towards Russia. Or NATO would move very quickly and put NATO troops in Ukraine and make Ukraine a NATO member. And Russia probably wouldn't dare to overturn that outcome with military force. So this positioning that they're playing with each other, you know, NATO and Russia, part of the game is inflicting unacceptable political and economic situations on your enemy, forcing your enemy to act first militarily, thereby having the moral justification to retaliate much more strongly. So that should also be understood. Uh, powers do try to entrap each other into military action, goad each other into military action. If I believed more in the competence of the Pentagon, I would believe that they had goaded Russia into an invasion that they knew Russia would fumble. I don't believe in their competence. I don't even think Russia is fumbling the invasion that badly. I do think the human, economic, and global cost of this conflict is going to be immense and would have been much, much better um, had, we could, had we navigated these geopolitics more gracefully, right? 
But I don't think we have the diplomatic caliber of uh, such people around. I mean, how old is Henry Kissinger? 96? Name a new Henry Kissinger on the American side, right? There isn't any, right? Name a Henry Kissinger on the German side. There isn't any. Um, Even Ukraine, right? Zelensky was shit at diplomacy. He was excellent at PR after the invasion started. But the, the goal of the Ukrainian government should have been to avoid this war at all costs. Would you summarize that as saying that that NATO has provoked Russia into this? I think NATO has not taken any steps uh, to avoid Russia undertaking this military action. That's what I would say. Provoke already puts the moralistic language, right? I'm actually very committed to sort of, you know, well, let's let's put it this way. I think this is an unjust war for what it's worth. I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine is unjust morally. But whether or not it's, you know, just morally, that's completely separate from the question of what is the geopolitical reality. And when it comes to the geopolitical reality, NATO had its hand. NATO could have honestly opted and just said unilaterally, Ukraine is never going to be a NATO country. We'll trade with them. We might even arm them. We want Ukraine to be well-armed and neutral. That could have been a viable policy. Now, I think, honestly, Western leaders assumed Russian weakness. They still assume Russian weakness. You can tell this in every press release that they give. They earnestly believe Russia is going to implode within a few days. I'm not convinced by that. Not at all. Not by the same people uh, that were swearing up and down for 20 years that every single American general went up on the podium and said, we're about to win in Afghanistan. I think the West is arguably, its leadership at least, is more disconnected from reality than Putin. That's sort of my basic bet. Now, Putin can still be immoral, but I, I do think, I do think the uh, idea that he's going insane is just, uh, it's just false. Hmm. I mean, I am in touch with quite a few uh, journalists inside Russia who say that they have seen him get more and more isolated during COVID in particular over the last couple of years. Like they used to know people who knew what he was up to. They used to know people within his, what you might call his regime. And now they they no longer do. They feel like the the visuals that we've seen of him kind of sitting at the end of the table, kind of completely disconnected from others are reflective of a, of a, of a type of isolation and that they never expected him to, to get involved in this, this war. Um, do you, do you disagree with that? I think that there is a solid streak of paranoia where I think Vladimir Putin is not afraid of COVID. He is afraid of a bioweapon targeted at Vladimir Putin's genome with symptoms similar to COVID. And if that sounds outlandish, consider for a second that he just believes the lab leak hypothesis. The lab leak hypothesis is just sort of the mainstream official position of the Russian government as to how this pandemic came to be. So really and- what I'm claiming here is Vladimir Putin's intelligence might be wrong, which is concerning, but I think he's physically avoiding people in order to avoid contracting a virus that he believes was unleashed specifically with the purpose of killing him. Sorry, which virus? The the lab leak? No, just a, a design virus that's very similar to COVID, just targeted to his genome, released into the general population, and uh, eventually is going to get him. That's that's the plot of the la- latest James Bond film. Oh, fun. I didn't know. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, so y- you mentioned before about it being an unjust war, and you you did bring in sort of the language of morality a little bit. And I do feel sometimes uh, when I listen to you talk, there is a kind of it, it's fantastic to have these wider frames and geopolitical frames, but I find it uncomfortable not not bringing in some sense of the morality. I've done quite a lot of work in on the conflict in Syria in particular. I've made a couple of documentaries mm-hmm. with Syrian mm-hmm. refugees, and I've got a lot of friends who were there during the conflict. And I find it like one of the things that's coloring my impression of what's going on at the moment is recognizing like how brutal Russia were in Syria. Like the kinds of they were found guilty by the UN of multiple war crimes, double tap bombings where they're they're willing to attack. Uh, and then blow up the emergency services when the emergency services arrive, targeting hospitals, which is something that 
if that happened in a Western country, there would rightly be a huge peace movement and a huge kind of consequences for their for their government. Yeah, what, what's your what's your attitude to that? Do you try and keep those moralistic frames out, or do you think that that is relevant to understanding what's happening? I think it does have a relevance, right? Um, it has the relevance of which outcome do you hope to work towards? So the question not of what is, but the question of what should be. It can still motivate, inform your actions, inform, you know, um, what you are trying to, you know, what kind of world you're trying to bring into existence. It also has some impact on the is of the matter. I don't much believe in the public's ability to overcome any sort of media bias, right? It's, it's very difficult. It's very, it's a very powerful force when the animal spirits of war are aroused you don't care about the war crimes of your side. You only care about the war crimes of the other side. Human history, unfortunately, I think really bears this out. When people had you know, basically good opinions of their armed forces, they were doing horrendous things abroad. So I would not trivialize, minimize, or deny any, say, Russian war crimes in Syria, any that might be happening right now in Ukraine. But I do note that we've been uh, you know, trivializing and minimizing uh, our own war crimes abroad as well. I think nasty things happened in Afghanistan, right? I think nasty things happened in Iraq. I think we sometimes washed our hands by providing weapons to moderate rebels in Syria. Who are the moderate rebels in Syria that we were arming? They were Islamic extremists, barely different from ISIS. At times, literally ISIS, right? We, we would literally give weapons to armed groups who would turn around and sell them to ISIS that was, you know, murdering people left and right. Do we have a moral responsibility there? Oh, yes, we do. Do I expect us to confront this moral responsibility in practice? No. Do I expect the Russians to confront the moral responsibility over the actions of their armed forces? No. So really, what we want to do is build a world where there's no good reason to be cruel, where there's no good reason to be brutal, where there's no good reason to, you know, be truly horrendous in your approach to war. Um, if I was more idealistic, I'd even say we should build a world where war just doesn't happen. Uh, but unless we study war scientifically, unless we study these things like the balance of power properly, unless we think about state interest, about how the internal politics of war works, right? Earlier, you raised Putin's isolation. Um, a viable and interesting hypothesis that you can't arrive moralistically at is that Putin is waging a war with Ukraine that's ill-considered as an excuse to purge his entire top staff of the generals, right? To figure out who is loyal, who is disloyal, right? Where you want people to be on board with an ill-conceived operation. But to come to that kind of hypothesis and analysis, like that's not a moralistic frame, right? That's like coming out of the necessities of the internal politics of the office he finds himself in, right? And, um, you know, that's, that's how I feel this should be navigated. I think we should understand the dynamics just as we might want to understand, you know, a lion hunting down a gazelle. I guarantee you, you know, the gazelle and the lion are not in harmony. The gazelle is feeling immense pain. Uh, you know, we can empathize with the gazelle. Maybe the lion feels the thrill of exaggeration, the, uh, the thrill and exhilaration of a, the chase and the hunt. I think the gazelle is just terrified. It's like, you know, really feeling, really feeling terrible. But if you want to understand nature biology, you, you, you know, you have to sometimes just watch how does the lion hunt? What are the population numbers of the gazelles and so on? And Unfortunately, until we get something better, that's where human politics really is. And given that there is, at the moment, we talked about kind of the narrative warfare, but there's a different, a very different frame where the narrative warfare in Russia literally means you're not allowed to even call it a war, that the only information you can now get is through official state channels. They've closed down the any of the opposition channels there. You said that there's little kind of, criticism of, of Western actions, but I said there's a huge amount more criticism of Western actions possible than is possible now in, in Russia. So there's an imbalance there as well now, is there not? I think the Russian media imbalance is, is severe. The Russian um, 
the, the future of Putin's government is in fact uncertain, right? I think that the economic damage is severe. My default, you know, you, you said earlier, you, you wanted say predictions, like sort of my default prediction is that, uh, you know, the Russians will occupy something like 70% of Ukraine's territory, perhaps leaving a rump Ukrainian state in Western Ukraine. Uh, they're going to basically successfully prop up puppet states like the Luhansk and Donetsk Republic. Um, Putin might be removed from power, but not this year. I think within the next five years, if he is replaced in power, he's going to be replaced by, uh, you know, a clique of generals. I don't think any other power center in Russia really can rival him. For example, like the sanctions we set up have evaporated and destroyed Russia's middle class. Would destroying Russia's middle class, does that truly hurt Putin? Or does it just hurt Russia's ability to project power in the future? I claim it hurts Russia's ability to project power in the future. When it comes to Putin, though, it weakens the democratic element that his formerly hybrid, now autocratic regime had. So really, it's um, it, it's sort of, again, it's like uh, the, the information environment the Russians are living in right now is completely disconnected from reality. But the information environment we are living in right now is also disconnected from reality. So what do you think the conventional wisdom is getting wrong at the moment? I would say that the conventional wisdom is ignoring the Russian willingness to take casualties, right? You referred previously to sort of the cruelty uh, of some of their interventions in Syria. Um, you know, I think, I think in fact that uh, a lot of Russian soldiers are going to die. Uh, dissent around this will be successfully suppressed. Um, and I think that new puppet states will be propped up, similar to those of the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic. So maybe, maybe over the coming week, Western pundits are going to start converging with this view, uh, but I've not yet seen it. So that would be sort of my disagreement. My disagreement is Russia will make territorial gains from this. Putin will not be removed from power within the next year. So uh, Ukraine's territory, unfortunately, is going to get carved up. Hmm. So I saw a, a tweet from David Frum, who you maybe would say is sort of the one of the, the most blue church perspectives. Um, and he said, uh, no Russian leader since Tsar Nicholas II has done his country so much harm so fast. He's isolated Russia from world trade, made the ruble worthless, destroyed 25 years of economic gains in a week in support of a failed war of aggression, has lost thousands of soldiers, wrecked masses of equipment without achieving any of its military objectives. What, what do you make of that? Because that's probably a good summary of the kind of um, status quo consensus position on this. Right, right. I I really do think the war is probably on net uh, not worth it for for Russia as as the state it is. However, it really depends on your assumption of how rapid Western decline is. If the West remains strong for the next twenty or thirty years, the war is an unmitigated strategic disaster. No, it's strategic separate from military, separate from moral disaster. It's definitely a moral disaster. But if the West is actually, you know, what Putin termed in his public speeches, uh, the empire of lies, in other words, that our strength is mostly hypothetical, this could be the beginning of a, of a kind of a bank run, not just a bank run on Russia and the ruble, but a bank run on the US security umbrella, a bank run on the Western financial system. I've not even heard discussions begin of the blowback of cutting out Russia from the global economic system. Right. You can argue, sure, its economy is as small as Spain. But you guys remember when, you know, people might still remember when Greece's economy collapsing was possibly a huge disaster for the whole European Union. Right. Greece having a smaller economy than Spain and much smaller than Russia. Russia remains the only energy provider Europe has. Europe is, in fact, dependent on Russia. So if Russia stops selling gas right now, it probably can't afford to do so 
Note the Germans are buying Russian gas as we speak. The gas is still flowing. Um, energy prices go up in Europe. In the long run, this means European deindustrialization and an impoverishment of Germany, Britain, and yes, France as well. I think this might in the long run be good for the United States. Uh, but I think for you know the European continent, it's not just a weakening of Russia. It will be an economic and other, um, and other type of weakening of Europe as well. Sure, the Germans can rearm. But if the German economy is more and more irrelevant, the entire, the entire German strategy for the last 40 years has been use our economic weight to affect a favorable security and trade and regulatory environment worldwide, that strategy has failed profoundly. If you can push the European Union to fail sooner, if you can pivot towards China and the Chinese economic integration, 30 years from now, the war that today is again, seems disastrous, might actually turn out to have been strategically brilliant. I don't think that's necessarily the default outcome, but I think it's ludicrous to deny that it's a, it's a possible possible outcome. Is one of the factors that there was a kind of naive belief for, for an awfully long time that economic integration would make actions like this impossible because it would damage the country so much and um, kind of famously Thomas Friedman's idea of the kind of golden arches theory of conflict prevention, like two countries. Well, that one's been disproved, no? <laughs> yeah, of course. It's been disproved a long time ago, but I just wonder if there's a kind of hangover of that that actually the flip side is also true, that it's not just economic integration that should make this impossible. It's that if something, if Russia makes actions like this, economic integration works both ways, that it becomes too costly for your own citizens to take the actions that you might need to do with sanctions or with cutting off energy supplies. So it's kind of an, un, an unexpected flip side of that kind of belief system, which was almost like a religious belief system for quite a long time. I think there was a hopeful moment in the 1990s. I, uh, I kind of grew up in this era, so I still remember it very well. Um, the desire, you know, the hope was, uh, you know, this ever globalizing world with catch up growth, with the spread and victory of democracy, the end of history, right? Uh, interventional humanitarian, you know, interventional interventionist humanitarian perspectives and how foreign policy should be done. Uh, rather than realist perspectives, you know, U.S. power is going to continue to endure, uh, but U.S. power will only be exercised through these multilateral institutions like the United Nations of the Kofi Annan era, or at the very least uh, through frameworks such as NATO. So it's going to be multilateral. It's not going to be unilateral. All the while, economic growth lifts, you know, a rising tide, it lifts all boats. I think some of that vision did come to be. I think uh, some countries ended up catching up and growing immensely, like China. Other countries were left behind. Um, the interventionist multilateralism quickly collapsed into unilateralism in the early 2000s, but there was still sort of a version, like kind of a new conservative version of unilateralism that people consider cynical, but I actually think is like sort of just this idealistic mugged version of 1990s globalism. So the flip side, right? The flip side is, I think tr perhaps the impetus, right? The impetus towards war has always been more disconnected from economics than we would like to think. On the eve of World War I, trade, global trade, was at a peak that would not be matched for many decades after the war. In a way, globalization was near a high watermark and it receded drastically to this war that no one really wanted, no one really intended. Um, actually, no, let me retract that statement. When I say no one wanted, that's false. Nearly everyone wanted World War I. If you read newspaper accounts at the time, the public is salvinating over war. They believe it's going to make their country stronger. They think the other side is, you know, an evil Hun, uh, you know, that's uh, about to do injustice to you, that they're fighting for the very soul of European civilization. Uh, the public was enthusiastic about the war. Decision makers thought that they could handle an enthusiastic public and still avoid war, that they were wrong. So I would say a lot of decision makers did not want war, but sort of went into it.
So I do, I do sort of feel that there's something very important about the fact that globalization was extremely high prior to World War I, and that the general public was enthusiastic about entry into the war, a war that proved a complete disaster for all sides involved. And I think really, this is how we should be thinking of it. If this is an immense disaster for Russia, it's not just a disaster for Russia. It's a disaster for the Western world as well. The global financial and economic system will never be the same. We have just shown that it is possible to kick out a country fully economically for not cooperating with our political and military views. Countries around the world will no longer see Western companies such as McDonald's or Starbucks or Facebook or Twitter as neutral services. They consider it a strategic priority to develop their own. India has often, over the last 10 years, signaled that it wishes to emulate China. I think Indian leadership would be basically you know, insane or treasonous to not just start blocking Western uh, social media websites and developing their own independent alternatives. If it is impossible for a country to pursue an independent strategy and it has to play with the Western strategy and has to trust in our multilateralism, our fairness, our justice, I think that's kind of a joke. I think they have no good reason uh, to you know, find the West trustworthy. Now, we who live in the West, we might perhaps wish to trust our elites a little bit more because I do think they're actually pursuing some version of Western economic and political interest. And we all as citizens uh, of this system, we, we do benefit from it. Um, but I think we're not really confronting how deluded we are to consider this like sort of the universal administration of a neutral system rather than the maintenance of, uh, of our hegemony. A hegemony that I think, again, places like China and India that are in fact rising powers, right? And again, no matter what Russia does, if it fights this war badly, if it fights this war well, it was a slowly declining power. Like rising powers such as China in the future India, perhaps eventually African states, um, they're going to see this system and not wish to participate in it. And we're not ready for that future. Do you do you not see anything um want of a better word superior or more admirable in Western values versus some of the value systems of some of the, these other countries? It sort of seems a little relativistic, your argument in this case. Sure. I think there are vastly there, there are very, very desirable things about West, Western values. There's a reason I described the sort of globalized 1990s world as idealistic. I think the aspiration towards pacifism is admirable. I think the aspiration towards abolishing poverty is admirable. I think a commitment to freedom of speech, freedom of thought is admirable. But then, David, let me ask you right back, like, how have we been enacting these values over the last 10 years? Have we been living up to these values? Freedom of speech, freedom of thought, economic Certainly prosperity. Certainly better than Russia and pacifism. China have. Certainly true. better than Russia and China have. True, true. No, no, no. Wait, wait. I'm not denying that we're doing a better job than Russia and China, but I'm proposing that perhaps we should judge ourselves on an absolute, not a relative standard. And that if we judge ourselves by an absolute standard through the course of our conflict with Russia and China, we have, instead of defending and spreading these values, walked these values back one step at a time. Through the course of this great conflict between powers, we are becoming more like the opposition, not less. And that's a critique that I feel morally compelled to voice. This is not a popular critique. It's not one that wins me any friends. It's received me a lot of pushback. But, um, you know, if, it, if I seem pessimistic, I'm pessimistic about our ability to live up to these values rather than rush headlong into a step-by-step -step convergence with Russia and China. Again, our system... I think enables more freedom, more prosperity than the Russian or Chinese system does. But where is it sure. trending? Where's the derivative going? That's what I'm asking. Sure. I guess your argument is kind of a little bit reminiscent of the clash of civilizations idea that there are different value systems. Um, and I would, yeah, I, I would argue that there is still substantial difference in in the values and in in the um, 
manifestation of those values, certainly relative to Russia or China. I think sure. if you're going to if you're going to say which which set of systems would you want to live underneath or would you want to live inside, then surely there's no there's no question. And that's very relevant to the Ukraine situation because they clearly do want to trend more towards the West, the EU, than they do towards Russia. Whether that's yes. naive and whether they'd be able to to do so, and whether we have to just accept that Russia needs its sphere of influence and has a right to its sphere of influence is one of the key questions within the the dynamic we're seeing at the moment. I guess no, no, it would be an immense look. It would be an immensely admirable feat of statecraft for someone to have secured an independent Ukraine that could follow its values in the direction that its citizens aspire towards. I think that would have been absolutely excellent. I think, unfortunately, right now, that is no longer on the table because of the regrettable outcomes. I think it's still possible for uh, you know the Western world to accept basically a significant number of Ukrainian refugees. I, I think that uh, th- the situation can be compared to the unfavorable outcome in Hong Kong, right? It would have been excellent for Hong Kong to maintain a freer society than the one it's been integrated into. Right. But, um, you know, events transpired as they did. And note, just because Ukraine wishes and wants to pursue economic integration, you know, I think really the time to build up its military is not right now. The time to have built up Ukraine's, again, independent military would have been over 10 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. I think that's when we should have started with both, um, you know, training, equipping, providing personnel, providing infrastructure. If we want to support values similar to Western values, what I would argue we should do is help these countries develop their own independent security approaches, their own independent foreign policy, right? We shouldn't be sticking them into our international system. Rather, we should help them develop in their course towards these values that we do in fact find positive. I sort of am making here an argument again that the values of the West do not need the empire of the West. That's that's perhaps one way to think of it. Hmm. Do you think this would have been any different under Trump? And if so, how? Uh, that's a tricky one. Um, I think the very fact that Trump is unpredictable would have stayed Putin's hand somewhat. Hmm. Right. I think I think we might have seen we might have seen a much more limited military operation still in Ukraine. I think we would have seen um, the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republic being armed as like proxy forces. But I think Putin would have actually been concerned that Trump, just because he doesn't know any better, would start World War Three over this. Mm. And what, yeah. what's your what's your opinion? You you asked me that provocative question, so I'll ask it right back. Yeah, I think it's. I think the unpredictability is a factor. Like you, you wouldn't know what he might do. It's equally likely that he would have been on the phone to Trump, and then Trump would have come out and said, "Well, you know, it's just like us occupying Texas. You've got to understand things from the from the from Putin's perspective." Right. I mean, that's kind of my instinctive feeling anyway. Is that it was just as likely that Trump would have waved it through and given Putin permission to do whatever he wanted, and then I would think you would have seen a real Western fracture. Kind of between Europe and the United States, would, yeah, 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 that would have that would have been the worst of all possible worlds, where you had like a complete fragmentation of the Western response to to the invasion, and I think that's as equal as likely as Trump kind of standing up to Putin and and facing him down. Right. Um, yeah, I, I I can just I can just picture him coming off the phone with Putin and saying that just as 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 likely as anything else. No, I, I I understand, understand. And I'm going to say I really don't envy the Biden administration and the problems it's dealing with. The reason I alluded to the pandemic is where I think in for a massive economic correction as it is. Remember the trillion dollar bills that were, you know, pumped into the stock market? Yeah. Add the sanctions, add possible economic warfare from Russia. I mean, people have not thought of, you know, all of those uh, ransomware people. What if Russia just tells them, go, go attack the stock market in America? Our stock market's fucked. Let's attack their stock market. 
what happens? Do we have the mechanisms? Like maybe we pause trading and pump a few more trillion dollars in, but that means we've pumped a few more trillion dollars in, making again corrections like system failures later so much worse. Um, I my hope is that Germany goes for nuclear power. That could sort of be a good outcome to this because really I think the Germans more than many others have been enabling Russia in what is in fact in behavior against our interests, right? Like their buying of Russian gas, we just cannot let that go. That is the one thing they have to stop doing. And if it means deindustrializing Germany, fine. If it means Germany building nuclear power plants, fine, but they have to stop doing that. And you mentioned the economic situation before. What would a Russian default mean for that? You're sort of sketching out a kind of long term that that you don't think the the economic situation for Russia is as bad as it seems, or that it is also going to be bad for the West. What would a default mean for for Russia and for Putin? I I, I think sort of I think it's uh I think it's unfortunate, but I think the Russian regime can absorb a decline in Russian living standards. And the Russians are going to experience a severe decline in living standards. Um, I think sort of this can weaken states, this can sap their ability to project power. But again, we should remember North Korea exists. Even Saddam Hussein, right, who was put under crippling sanctions that facilitated the ease of his defeat in 2003, held on to power for 12 years after the first Gulf War despite those severe sanctions, right? So I think the idea that sanctions quickly topple a regime are false. I think it is tragic in a way that, uh, you know, the people of Russia are going to suffer under these, just as it's tragic that the people of Ukraine are are suffering in this invasion. Um, I think that Russia is going to pivot very strongly towards their one remaining major trade partner, China. And, uh, you know, China, I think, has the ability to bail out Russia, sort of keep Russia on economic life support, because it is not in China's interest to have Russia collapse. So uh, I think a coupling of Russia to the Chinese system feels like the default outcome right now. And what do you think that means for the world if that happens? Well, high energy prices in Europe, uh, slow deindustrialization and impoverishment of Europe. I think the United States will do well, though. I think the United States will uh, pursue energy independence because it has the raw resources needed for it. And it will, to a significant extent, attempt to reshore production because they will understand that China's industrial base is not just an economic competitor. It's now a strategic competitor right? China has the full stack of services, industrial and financial, to replace the Western system for any other country, right? It's no longer like this ragtag uh, team of, you know, the axis of evil of the early 2000s of like North Korea, Iran, Venezuela. In fact, Russia going uh, this way has forced the West to negotiate with Iran and Venezuela to try to get them to export oil, right? No, no, that fact. It means we cannot simultaneously embargo these three places. We cannot simultaneously sanction these three places. And, uh, you know, China has gotten much wealthier. China, in fact, as you said, represents a different pool of values, a different social system. Um, it's, you know, I do think, I do think China gets, grows out of this stronger. So maybe, maybe my perspective is that the war between, you know, we could call it a cold war, a proxy war, Honestly, I hope it's not a hot war between NATO and Russia. Uh, the only winner is China. Mm. Although China at the moment doesn't seem to be backing Russia as much as people maybe expected. Well, China's interests are distinct from Russia's interests. I said bail out Russia, right? Not rescue Russia economically. Do the bare minimum needed to stabilize the country, leaving Russia in a maximum position of dependence on China. Optimal strategically for for China. And you you've talked about whether you think it makes it more or less likely for China to to invade Taiwan and that you think it means that it's much more likely in the near term 
do you think, I mean, my, my sense is that China is um, risk averse more than anything else. And sure. it seems like a very high risk strategy to do something when, when everything is trending in their favor in the longer term. Right. The domestic political constraints of China have to be considered, though. Uh, it's very important that when it comes to uh, when it comes to sort of Chinese decision making, right now there is no way it, it, there's no way to advance your career by arguing restraint. So right now in the Chinese Communist Party, there's like a groundswell wave of slow creeping upward promotions happening for everyone who is uh, arguing that China should be more assertive. If you check the feelings on Chinese social media, unabashedly pro-Russian, which might seem extremely strange to us, but the TikTok videos and so on, very popular, uh, have people describing this desire to throw off the, the sort of NATO shackles, this idea that the US has frustrated them at every turn from taking their rightful place. They might not really care about Russian interests or Russian imperial ambitions, but they definitely do empathize with this desire to oppose the West, right? So this is the groundswell feeling. Um, at every level of Chinese bureaucracy, promotions are not carried out on the basis of who advocates caution. So the Chinese strategy has been a winning strategy, just be very cautious, very slow. Okay, but just because it's a winning strategy, doesn't mean the Chinese state and government is going to continue to carry it out. So when I said that um, there's always an irrational element to war, what I mean often is that there is difficulty in coordinating a country well enough to execute a rational geopolitical strategy. Famously, during World War II, the Japanese army and the Japanese navy had different ideas of who their enemies should be because that produces, you know, different abilities to fundraise, right? So if you're arguing, we're going to fund, we're going to fight the Soviets, that's very good for the military. If you argue that, you know, we're going to fight the Americans, that's very good for the Navy. And, uh, you know, China, uh, sorry, Japan got stuck in a land war in China and a sea war versus America, a terrible state of affairs for Japan, the country, but every single step of the way, politically, uh, you know, reasonable for both the army and the Navy that had severe, deep, inter-service rivalry and vast control over Japan's economy and significant pull over its, uh, over its politics. So really let's ask ourselves, which, what is the young faction? What is the new faction in China? Is it truly the cautious thinkers? I'm not sure they are. And you know, when it comes to Xi, I think he personally wants reunification of China to be his political legacy. He only has another 10 years to do this. He might choose to do it peacefully. But again, the suspension of the Hong Kong experiment is notable. Arguably the main reason Hong Kong civil liberties were slowly boiled away rather than immediately revoked back in 1997 was that it offered the credible promise of one country, two systems, offering Taiwan a peaceful path towards reunification. Do we see a peaceful path to Taiwanese re reunification? that the Chinese Communist Party is offering. I don't think they're offering any such deal except surrender, right? Which might not mean invasion. It might just mean building up a force so strong that it could take the island and then it doesn't have to. Uh, but I don't think there's going to be, there's not going to be a solution there, unfortunately, from, you know, that, that avoids the relevance of a military factor. So... Samo, I, you've got a really interesting perspective. I, I'm not 100% on board with all of it, but what I like sure. is that you're prepared to make solid predictions and we'll be able to find out, I guess, relatively soon whether your take what the is correct is. or not. And, and How I, would I you summarize emphasize... that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can, I can summarize my own perspective, but I do have to emphasize there's a whole number of things that you know, as far as I can tell is the case that I wish is not the case. So I'm in the happy, happy position where every time I'm sort of proven wrong, I'm often very happy to have been proven wrong. So I'll be absolutely delighted if, you know, Ukrainian sovereignty is preserved, if, uh, you know, both say the Putin government is replaced by more Western values aligned government, 
and uh, the sanctions can be lifted. So the suffering of the Russian and Ukrainian people is alleviated. All of these are great outcomes. And then if I were to boil it down into three predictions, right? Three predictions. China develops more alternatives to the Western financial and economic system and starts offering them to rogue states around the world. Number two, Russia successfully occupies large chunks of Ukraine that it did not control before this invasion. So I'm not counting the small Donbass region or the small Luhansk region or Crimea. I'm talking about new regions. These new regions will at first be governed by puppet states, and then eventually they're going to be integrated into Russia, much as Crimea has been. Number three, Putin remains in power for the next year. I don't know what happens after. So in other words, the course of this war that is perhaps strategically bad for Russia, note that Russia being a Chinese vassal, which is what I'm predicting, is, a, is not a happy, not a good outcome from even a Russian realpolitik perspective. But still, the third, the third point is then, uh, you know, this, this war is not going to be interrupted by internal political instability within Russia. So you're pretty confident, because that is the, uh, the one thing that is imponderable at the moment. There was a nascent anti-war, or there were some anti-war forces, especially during the Georgia campaign. You saw the mothers of the soldiers right, become more and more right. prominent. That ultimately is the big question as to what happens inside Russia. If there is a, the birth of an anti-war movement within Russia, would that significantly change your predictions? Have we seen it? I've not yet seen it. If there There's, is one, I mean, there that, are a lot of pro notable. protesters who are being arrested, and um, that, that maybe, but, but they are they, they are being arrested, right? They are being arrested. That's the important part. the The real test of civil resistance is when the soldiers do not want to shoot and the police officers do not want to arrest. I note that the yellow jacket protests never ended in France, but as long as the police were willing to arrest the protesters, push them away. They didn't matter. The anti-vax protests, as long as they took place, as long as the police were willing to arrest them, they didn't matter. Uh, Russia shook off the heavy boot of the power of the Communist Party because the soldiers weren't willing to shoot. So really, if I were to put hope anywhere for political change, it is that the rank and file soldiers and security services in Russia decide that the patriotic thing is not supporting the official government, but resisting it and, you know, siding with whatever popular protest movement might happen. That's a really interesting perspective and makes a lot of sense. Samo, thank you again. It was a really good exchange. As I say, I don't agree with everything you say, but we will find out fairly soon because um, you're you're brave enough to kind of stick your colors to the mast and make some solid predictions. Wonderful. Um, yeah, and thank you for having me on the show again. It's always good to discuss these topics back and forth. With controversial dis topics, they can become heavy, dark. Um, but I, I do ultimately think of myself as an optimist. I think 50 years from now, I think the world will be uh, freer and more prosperous than it is today. Samo, thank you. Thank you.